everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dojo Live. My name is Kim Lantis, and I'm happy to be co-hosting today with Carlos Ponce in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Hey, Carlos. Hi, Kim. Hey. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. I know. It is fun. I, we, we didn't get to have our live show yesterday, so first one of the week. Absolutely. So our guest today, I'm happy to welcome John Sockle a COO and co-founder at Limbix Health. And today's topic of conversation is going to be a really good one. I think it's extremely timely and something that I probably would have appreciated when I was in seventh grade. So <laughs> John, we're really, really happy to have you here today. Uh, as we kick off our show, could you please tell us a bit more about you, John, who you are, what your background is, and kind of what makes you tick? We'd like to get to know you better. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. You know, my name is John, like you said, and I spent the last uh, maybe decade or so of my career working on the business teams of Silicon Valley companies. And um, and early in my career, after getting my MBA, I spent most of my time working in the enterprise software space or B2B software space, which was uh, certainly interesting. But ultimately, you know, a little bit about me, I come from a family of physicians and, you know, and th while those were great experiences, I wanted to do things that would make a difference in healthcare. And that's what led me to Limbic's. Uh, which we started just a little over five years ago, and we are building digital therapeutics for adolescent mental health. That's great. Like I said, seventh grade year was probably one of the toughest years of my life. You probably couldn't pay me enough. You could offer me a billion dollars, I'm pretty sure, and I'd say I'd say no. Uh, so, John, you've already touched on Limbics and yeah. uh, digital therapeutics. Are, uh, so please, uh, what? tell us a bit more about Limbics, what it is that you do. Sure. So, you know, what we're, we're, who we're trying to help here is the over 3 million people in the United States who are uh, young people in the United States who are currently experiencing symptoms of depression. It's something that we're seeing growing more and more, especially exacerbated by COVID. And so what Limbix is trying to do is build programs that can be used as a form of treatment. One of the things that we're really challenged with as a society is that we only have so many providers in the mental health space and a growing, growing amount of demand that is um, outpacing it. And then the amount of treatment options that are available to those providers, you know, are, are relatively limited. And, and so we see many primary care physicians are finding cases now upstream, way before you would even get to a therapist. And, um, and then they're left with limited treatment options. And so Limbix is really trying to serve pediatricians and other primary care providers who are seeing many of these cases on the front line and equipping them with um, you know, other tools that they can also use in their arsenal, uh, in addition to some of the ways that they might treat folks today. Nice. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're, we're glad to have you on today's show. Carlos, talking about the show, if you wouldn't mind, what is today's topic? Of course, Kim. And thanks, uh, John, for being with us today. So today we are going to be discussing the role of digital treatments in the adolescent mental health crisis. So that's a topic as, as chosen by our guests today. So first question that I have for you, John, is why did you choose this particular topic and why did you feel it was relevant for today's day and age? Let's start there, please. Thank you. Sure. So I think that where this starts is that we always felt like there was a role for technology to play in the treatment of mental health. And so my co-founder, Ben Lewis, and I, when we started the company, that was a big part of our thinking. And then as time evolved, we started to really narrow in on areas that we felt were the most underserved. And so that really was where we got to the adolescent market. We had kind of looked around and had you know, met many pediatricians and other folks in the industry who were telling us that there was a desperate need for more treatment options. And as someone who's been working in technology for most of their career, I was really excited to find ways to use technology for good and to, and to hopefully make a dent on um, on what's really a desperate need right now, which is mm -hmm. just more access to treatments for people struggling with uh, mental health uh, or other like or things like depression. For sure. As we talk about this, uh, can you please define what a prescription digital therapeutic is? Yeah. Right. And particularly for me, the word prescription is what's tripping me up because when I think of prescription, I'm thinking of something really that's being ingested. Is that still right. the case or how is this, how is this working? That's a fabulous question. And I'm really excited you asked that. 
Um, so I'll first kind of explain what a digital therapeutic is, and then I can explain maybe please, what the prescription please, part is. Please do. Uh, so digital therapeutics are programs delivered through digital devices, and they typically provide evidence-based therapeutic interventions, um, and they're designed to typically prevent, manage, or treat you know, various diseases and disorders. Um, where we differentiate on the prescription side is that there are many health and wellness applications that are out there in the marketplace, and they don't have to necessarily go undergo the same level of clinical testing and rigor that companies like Limbix do. And so one of the things that makes a prescription unique is it has to be delivered through a clinician. And so SparkRx, our first therapeutic for uh, 13 to 22 year olds with depressive symptoms, has to be administered or, or provided by a doctor and so, uh, or a uh, nurse practitioner or a licensed social worker, folks who can, who have um, medical credentials and can decide that this is an appropriate intervention for that person. That makes a lot of sense. So it's essentially a quality control element, which I'm sure a lot of parents or caregivers would appreciate, particularly when you're putting, you know, your child or someone you love um, in the hands of someone else. Because honestly, the internet is a very dangerous, potentially dangerous place, right? It's fascinating and wonderful and potentially dangerous at the same time. So that's, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, I think we really want to make um, make it easier for doctors to feel comfortable providing apps and whether it's in the, you know, the, the disease areas that we're serving in or other digital therapeutic companies out there. I think that we're all hoping to partner, you know, closely with the clinicians and providers out there in the world and make sure that we're solving problems for them and also their end patients. And I think if we're doing that in a way where we're studying things rigorously and, and trying to make sure that we provide a lot of the same research that you know your typical pharma companies would uh, to get their drugs to market. And we think that's going to be a compelling way to uh, bring these products uh, into people's hands in the future. John, um, let me ask you a question from what I usually call the layman's perspective or the user okay. perspective. Okay. Uh, in my case, I'm very interested in this because um, I am about to be, well, I'm not about to, I am the parent of a 10 year old who will soon be, you know, uh, an adolescent, a teen. Yeah. I don't know. Then my other kids are not teens anymore, but I will have one soon. So I'm very interested in what is it that I can expect in terms of what do I need to keep an eye on for like warning signs or red signals or, you know, anything that's going to help me uh, digitally. Is there anything that can help me digitally yeah. to just be on the lookout for any potential uh, hazard signs that might require immediate action to prevent uh, depression? So what can you what can you tell us parents about this particular topic? Sure. How do, so, how do you tackle it? Yeah. So I'll caveat my answer that I'm not a clinician, and uh, and, and so I'll mm -hmm. start with that. But okay. you know where I would sort of um, recommend is bringing you know your child to their primary care doctor to their you know to their physician on a regular basis. And what we're seeing more and more in uh, in pediatrics is that. Um, primary care providers are screening for things like depression, anxiety, and other mental health um, uh, indications. And so what we're going to expect to see is that more and more of these are being diagnosed than ever before. Cases are being diagnosed than ever before. And so that's where I'd start it. And then if you know you had a clinician that potentially was interested in learning more about programs like SparkRx or potentially other programs as well, then you could, you know, pass them along and let them decide if that was, uh, you know, really in their best interest to provide to the patient. Uh, yes. And uh, let me, uh, thanks for the explanation and for the yeah. uh, su suggestion, but I would like to add to my question, if I may, what yeah, I was referring course. more was, I was more referring to the digital component of, let me, mm. for, for example, yeah. uh, my, my son, uh, he spends a good chunk of time of the day with, digital devices, be sure. it uh, 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 VR device or computers, or, or and I, we try to limit it, but there's a still yeah. some very heavy interaction. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yes. So what can I look at? Where can I expect in terms of technology that's going to help me, you know, do something that yeah. might help me take the right measures, if I may say so? So one of the things that our program, SparkRx, is built on is a protocol around behavioral activation. And the, you know, big part of the uh, program will teach students or, or teens the difference between up and down activities mm -hmm. and things that they're doing that 
potentially might feel good at first, like scrolling through Instagram or playing video games forever. Um, but or it, and as well as other activities, you know, that might be seemingly more challenging at first, like mm -hmm. maybe helping mom with the dishes, but, you know, rewarding later. And so these are parts of uh, the program where we help students identify or teens identify those um, those differences between those. Mm -hmm. And a big thing that I would really want to emphasize is that we're not looking to build a program that gets teens into another app for longer periods of time. We're trying to teach them about things that they can do in real life that align mm -hmm. with their values mm -hmm. and that will help them feel better uh, because they align with their values. And, and so that's sort of the, the crux of the program. Of course. And, you know, and, and we built this with subject matter experts from leading universities across the country to kind of help get us these ideas and protocols. And then we digitize them into a format that was consumable for teens and, you know, so that they can hopefully uh, get through these programs and, and, and get better. Awesome. I look forward to learning more. So I'm yeah. going to pass, on, yeah. I'm gonna pass it on to Kim. Please. No, this is actually perfect because when I was preparing for today's show, that's actually one of the questions I had uh, referring to my own, you know, middle school experience, uh, which of course involved, I think, a really common experience, um, bullying and things like that. Of course, when I was in middle school in the mid early mid 1990s we didn't have social media smartphones etc and i can only imagine how much more challenging such situations would be in today's day and age and so one of my questions was i kind of wanted to play this devil advocate kind of irony of maybe we could talk to the impact that technology social media and other things has had in perhaps the increase in in mental health um, crisis with this age group, but then also the irony of utilizing technology to help fix it because that's really what's resonating, I think, with this group. So um, it's interesting of how is your technology a technology that's helping people wean themselves from other technologies? I Am I making sense? Well, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that we're trying to, you know, wean people off of one technology or the other. But I would say is that there are behaviors and things that people are doing on a consistent basis that are detrimental to their health, then we'd want to wean them off of those. And, uh, you know, none of us, I would say at this company necessarily are looking to build an addictive app. This isn't like a gaming company where we're trying to get you to spend lots of time in here going through levels and, and having upgrades and things like that. This is really meant to teach core principles that could be helpful for you in your life and get you in and get you out. And doing those in, in, you know, outside of your phone, hopefully. Um, but that, I think that would be how I'd answer that question. Thank you. Carlos, go ahead. Yes, please. Thank you, Kim. Appreciate it. Okay. So uh, we are, today's, in today's conversation, we're discussing, um, just give me one second, some technical things here, okay? We're discussing, uh, in the topic, we're discussing a crisis. So, the a mental health crisis. Yeah. So if we uh, hone in that particular aspect of the conversation, uh, w where, from your standpoint, as uh, the founder of Limbix, from your standpoint, where, w what is the the root of this crisis? What's going on that's going to that's taking teens to this particular crisis that that you mentioned here in today's conversation? Why is so there a crisis? A, sure. I mean, I think that there's a, a variety of things happening that are continuing to grow, like the number of cases that we're seeing. We can point to things like social media, but there's, I think there's a, a variety of reasons that can be maybe true and potentially not true. But I think the, the biggest thing is, is that you've got more and more diagnoses happening within medicine. You've got more and more access to information than ever before. You also have a destigmatization of mental health. So you have a generation that is, I think, potentially more open to being uh, to sharing struggles they're going through. And 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 so when you combine these different factors here, you end up just we've just increased our total demand from patients for services and treatments to higher levels than ever before. In parallel, you know, we have just only a few treatment options for teenagers who are struggling with things like depression. You can prescribe things like antidepressants, which have one of the weaker effect sizes in psychiatric medicines and, and, and concerning side effect profiles, at least for many of the doctors that speak to us. And you can also prefer folks to therapy. Or we see in behavioral health are six month wait lists, high costs, and, and things that are not necessarily improving access. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. John. 
Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's a really good point. So enter limbics, another al- option alternative when, you know, you might not have the financial resources, the time, maybe yeah. you've tried other things that just aren't working. Let's talk a little bit to your tech, to your platform. How does it work? Um, what are, what exactly are you, are you offering with your product? So for patients, we're offering an alternative treatment to, or, or an, ad, an adjunct treatment to things like psychotherapy or medications. Um, and so we really try to uh, you know, make sure that we're providing something that's really well researched and safe and, um, and, and built on a, compl- on, a, on a system that is really gonna take your data obviously seriously. From a provider standpoint, we're really trying to give folks first lines of defense uh, treatments that they can use with all of these cases that they're seeing now. And so we really try to serve a couple different customers here. Uh, we're trying to make sure that one, the providers and clinicians and doctors who are seeing so many of these cases in the front line have immediate accessible tools that don't cost them money and that make it easy for them to, um, you know, to, to treat their patients. And then on this, and I can say the same thing on the patient side. And one of the things that's really neat about Limbix right now and the program SparkerX is that it is completely free and it's free because there's an emergency going on right now um, that, you know, with the pandemic. And, and so we went to market under this discretionary enforcement authorization under the FDA. And so as part of that, by being at an immediate available resource, we, we didn't look at this as an opportunity to charge customers. We looked at this as an opportunity to help people. And so this is something that's accessible and available right now and, um, and, and will be for the future. Very cool. Uh, um, Sorry, one real quick. If I oh yeah, go ahead. can, we talk about what my experience with Spark RX would be like from the physician side, and then yeah. what my experience would be like as yeah. a patient as well. Yeah. So, from a physician side, if you would like to be offering this, you'd go to SparkRx.com, enter your information like your NPI number and your email address, and then from there, you'd be given an access code that you would be able to use to with patients for access to the program. In addition to that, you'll receive a bunch of um, information like indications for use and talking points for clinicians and all of the regulatory sort of uh, guidance that goes along with our product. And then once that patient um, is then given, you know, this access code, they go to the app store on Android or iOS, and then they would go download SparkRx, enter that access code. Then the, pa- then the doctor who's given you or that provider who's given you that access code would also optionally have um, be able to see um, outcomes data in there. We, we collect weekly PHQ patient health questionnaires uh, along the way to sort of assess and measure progress. And so that would be something that a, a clinician would be able to view and, and potentially have an interesting talking point uh, for their next visit with the, with the patient. John, I'm curious about something in particular. Okay, so you have the limbics in the middle and then on one side you have the doctor's the, the um, you know the, the medical doctors and then the specialists and then you have the patients right so mm-hmm. are in all privacy considerations in place of course are you planning on maybe gathering insights or raw data that could contribute to collaborating with maybe uh, public health programs that could help do something or act upon this crisis or or the the mental health sector uh, at large. It, so is there anything in play in this regard? No, I, I wouldn't necessarily say so. I think that, you know, we, we really want to make sure that folks feel like that their data isn't going to be shared with other parties outside of their provider. And so, you know, we don't have necessarily mm-hmm. plans to resell or, or to offer data um, that's, that, that, that's from these private programs. And so that'd be my short answer to that. No, I think that mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I think with technology okay. no, too, and no, the that's abilities, fine. Yes, I was thinking more in terms yeah. of just public uh, health yeah. programs. No, but it makes sense. Like the this the role. ability to encrypt oh, and of, maintain. Of course, private, private, privacy considerations considered. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think there's a bit yeah. of a delay. I wasn't intentionally talking over anyone if that was the case. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, there's there's even, you know, a lot of, you know, there's even questions we get about parents having access to this data. Right. And so, and so there's, you know, I think that that's a, that would be a large objection mm-hmm. for many of the people we serve. Yeah. But it is, I mean, to your point, Carlos, I think it is interesting with technology that exists and the ability to um, encrypt and make things anonymous, but still access that big data, which might be useful um for, you know, the science behind it. But yeah, to your point, I think, John, 
mental health is something that inherently needs to be quite private. Absolutely. Oh. But we, well, we certainly publish everything that we can, right? We want to publish as an organization, all results, whether they are positive or not, we want to mm -hmm. be as transparent as possible. Uh, that's certainly our goal. Speaking of results, what are you seeing? What would you say? Is there like a particular use case or statistics that you could yeah. pull regarding the use of technology like yours? Sure. Um, I can speak to at least Limbic's results and, and things like that. So for SparkRx, what we find is that um, for, pro for patients who get through the program, they're able to see clinically meaningful drops in depressive symptoms as measured by the patient health questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And so that is a relatively standard assessment that many providers or other researchers might use uh, to evaluate somebody's health or mental health. And so that's something that we're pretty excited about. And then I'm hoping that, you know, obviously anybody who's working in this space, who's creating digital therapeutics is, is publishing and, 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 and being transparent with their data as much as possible. Great. Uh oh, looks like we may have lost Carlos and he's, he's controlling this business. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> okay. No problem. All right. Perfect. And I think, I think I, I hate to be the star of the show right now, but he's the one who gets to switch the cameras. It's kind of awkward, <laughs> but yeah, as we, as we talk about this, I just, before we leave, I really do want to speak, especially to the design and the patient experience. Now yeah. for this particular age group, I, I think this, this course was quite intentional because, you know, 13 to I think 21, you said, um, these are definitely tech savvy folks who have literally grown up or don't really know life without a smartphone in their hands. So what kind of yeah. design and did you put into this or what was sort of the usability or factors that you kept in mind as you're designing um, Spark yeah. RX, I think is the name. Yes, that's a fabulous question. And I think um, I'm really glad you asked it. So one of the things that we did early on is we built a teen advisory council. And so this was a group of teenagers who had a mix of backgrounds from across the country. And what we wanted to do was make sure that every single screen we designed made sense, you know, was engaging for a teenager, was like, you know, the types of stuff that we, we saw a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy related apps in the market. And they were meant for ages like 15 to, you know, 75 or, or beyond that. And, you know, the types of things that a 15 year old goes through is a lot different than a 75 year old goes through. And so a big part of that program was getting feedback on all of the screens that go through that. So we talked a little bit up front about creating this program with subject matter experts and, uh, and known uh, protocols that are worked and, and then bringing them into a digital format. Once we bring those in those digital formats, we really want to want to test those with those teen users not just from an efficacy standpoint, but also just is this engaging? And so for example, one of the um, things that's a byproduct of that is we have a character called Limbot. Limbot is a little robot that can be customized that takes you through the program, this avatar. And Limbot is not necessarily something that I would have picked as a first choice to take me through a program. But when we run mm -hmm. a bunch of tests, we found that this was something that really helped uh, improve therapeutic alliances, much like you're looking to to do in therapy. And mm -hmm. we thought, oh, gee, maybe we should include this. And so that would that'd be an example of how we try to incorporate teenage feedback into the program. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. As yeah, we're coming to the, the final uh, minutes of our show, we always kind of like to highlight the culture, the company culture of the companies that we get to speak to. I think it's something great that similar companies yeah. or even companies, you know, tech companies that might not be in the same vertical as you get to learn yeah. from one another. So how would you describe the, the Limbic's company culture? Why would someone kind of want to come work with you guys? So I, I think there's a, a variety of values that we share as an organization. I think first and foremost, we wanna make sure that we're building products that are accessible. Um, and, and, and so we have, a, a, I think, a lot of like-minded folks with that mindset. You know, our other core values are about making ethical, responsible decisions for the way that we do our research trials, for the, you know, the way we talk about the market and the way we want to help people. Uh, we, we're a relatively mission-driven company as well. I mean, I think we're, we're focused on a pretty narrow age range and, and the set of you know, problems that we think can resonate to almost anyone. Um, and so we really, I think those are a few things that we, we think about as a company. Um, so we, I think we're a good marriage of your traditional Silicon Valley um, 
tech and product and sort of development processes that go with that. But we've also married that up with clinical and scientific expertise that um, can really help guide the way we build things. And so we really have a, a pretty eclectic mix of people here and, um, and are trying to make sure that we solve problems for, for a, an eclectic mix of group, uh, across the country. So I think, um, I think Linux is a pretty fun place to be. And, nice. uh, you know, uh, and, I hope, and one of the things I'm most proud of is, is how uh, our team has really stuck together over the last few years in, in mm -hmm. the era when there's been more people leaving companies than ever before. Uh, it's just not what's happening here. Right. So as a co-founder, Limbix, how old are you now? I am as a company? As a company, Limbix, yes. Uh, Not you, John. If you wanna if you wanna share if there's any interested uh, individuals out there, but we're uh, five and a half years old. Okay. So as co-founder, and in these last five and a half years, this yeah. is my last question, I think, as we're coming sure. to the end of the show. What do you feel that you really got right as you were founding this company? And what is something that maybe you would have done differently? So I think that what we got right is that we've always had a strong commitment to making really high quality products. And we've shown that in our, in our five plus year history. Um, what I would probably do differently though, was be more strategic about where in the market. Let's not go there, please. Let's not go there. <laughs> Sorry. No, I think Carlos is a little behind. He was probably on the sharing of the age joke, I'm guessing. So oh, okay. I don't think he was intentionally shutting you up. We really are interested in, just in focusing on high quality products. <laughs> yeah. Can you repeat your question again? That kind of threw me off. Yeah. <laughs> we were asking about what you did right, which he answered, yeah. really focusing on a high quality yeah. product. And the, the second half of my question was, what is something you may have done differently? So I think if I could have done this differently, I really would have focused um, a little more on the problem solution for a specific customer type. And so early on, we, we saw that there was a demand for mental health services and a need for technology potentially to help service that demand. But um, I, I, in because there's just only so many providers. But I think as we got smarter as an organization, we said, okay, this is an area of the market we can really make a dent in. And so we got more focused about seeing that consistently primary care pediatrician, you know, other folks, uh, frontline folks in, in those age ranges were seeing more and more mental health cases before. And then we also saw that from a patient standpoint, there was, uh, I think, more receptivity to digital therapeutics than maybe other age ranges would have been. And so that was sort of, uh, I think, something that if I could have done it again, I would have been a little more focused on that. But, uh, you know, that, that's the process yeah. of learning. Well, like they say, better late than never, right? Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, John, uh, for being on our show today. Uh, you know, technical difficulties aside, and there goes Carlos. Hopefully he can come back to end this broadcast because I'm not sure how to do that. Or I'll just smile at the camera for like 10 minutes or something. <laughs> that sounds great, Kim. But John, it was a blast to have you. I wish you and Limbix the best of luck. I, I really thank you so that. much for this very unique niche that you've tapped into. Extremely timely, extremely necessary. Uh, as we are signing off today, and hopefully Carlos gets to join us, I would like to share what we've got coming up for the rest of this week on Dojo Live. Tomorrow, we actually are going to be having two live shows, our design thinking segment with Tulio at 10 o'clock Pacific is going to be with Daniel Raskin, co-founder and CPO and CMO of Imperative. And he'll be talking specifically to RevOps and Revenue Marketing the emerging practice of unifying go-to-market operations. And then tomorrow afternoon at 12 o'clock Pacific, we will be speaking with Rob Palumbo, CEO of Outpoint, who was supposed to be our guest yesterday, but we had other technical difficulties. And so tomorrow's afternoon show is going to be AI-powered media mix modeling, say that 10 times fast, built okay. for the post-iOS 14 reality. So don't miss it. Two shows tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific, and noon Pacific. We'll see you then. John, thank you again for joining us today. I apologize Hi. for the glitches uh, to both of you, John and Kim. <laughs> we, we got you know, it. These things, these things have the, the least timely manner of happening. So I apologize. <laughs> Kim, thanks for taking the, the, the announcements. Okay. We got I it. The show it. must go on. Yeah. The so show we're good. must go on indeed. Okay, John. Well, thank you for having been with us on the show. And uh, please stay with us as we go off the air. And as Kim said, tomorrow we have two shows. Join us and be safe. Thank you. Thank you.